Good afternoon. My name is Curtis Merriam. As you just said, we are from Dominique College. Last year, a student of ours was performing a, performing a topo survey while serving an internship. After setting the needed points for the day, the crew, the crew moved on. The next day, a pond bordering the points had been drained. This affected the vertical and horizontal locations of the nearby points to varying degrees. That situation is what inspired our project. We chose to investigate possible effects of moisture and temperature change on the elevation of different service types and control points. During this presentation, we will uh, communicate our data and findings on this project. So, Danny the College of Technology is uh, located in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it was, it was founded in the year 1914. It is a private, non-profit institution, and each year, on average, it has uh, 20 students enrolled in the serving and civil engineering program. The team members for this project are Kathy Merriam, who is a Navy veteran. We have uh, Patrick Kowal. He works for a small civil engineering firm. And myself, Francis Maraga. Originally, I'm from Kenya. So we wanted to start and complete our project safely. And for that reason, we observed a pretty number of uh, safety precautions. And uh, they included, but not limited to, avoiding private and private property and protected areas. We also used uh, personal protective equipment and appropriate clothing for the weather in Minnesota. As well, all the time with us, with ourselves, oh, we carried a, a first aid safety kit just in case of any emergency. And we are limited to working our field, doing all our field work during the day to avoid any potential dangerous interaction with the public. The topic, as you all know, that was put out by NSPS this year was how does uh, one apply high precision fertile control in the real world? Our project is comparing and contrasting methods and results of various types of leveling conducted prior to and post the ground freezing for the winter. Our goals were to compare various types of methods of leveling and their accuracy, as well as to monitor, measure, and determine whether the precipitation and freezing temperatures had an impact on surface elevations. The parcel we chose is a park in Minneapolis. It's uh, called the uh, Theoworth Park. It is located at Section 20, Township 29 North, Range 24 West. The site area of our loop that we chose was approximately 11.04 acres. So at the outset of our project, we identified four different methods to determine point elevations that we selected to utilize. Namely being APS, automatic leveling, the total station, and the digital level. In the case of the GPS, we selected a Topcon Hyperview digital receiver with an FC5000 data collector. We maintained horizontal and vertical tolerances that were below 500 of a foot during this process. Furthermore, we utilized the real-time reference network to connect to the cores network that is operated and maintained by the Minnesota Department of Transportation. For the automatic level, we utilized the Sokia C330 automatic level. In order to maintain accuracies, we made sure that our foresights and backsights were not more than 150 feet in either direction. Furthermore, we conducted a two-peg test during each time that we utilized the automatic level in the field and closed to within 1 100th foot. In order to uh, also eliminate collimation errors, we measured off uh, either by pacing or by measuring tape the uh, midpoint between each of our two points and set up at, uh, the, uh, as close to the exact midpoint as possible. 
so that we did not have any error. As far as the total station is concerned, we utilized the Trimble M3 total station, which is a five second device. In order to uh, test the accuracy of this uh, instrument, we utilized the vertical calibration function on the total station, where we sighted a prism rod at a known point greater than 200 feet uh, with the front face and then reversed to the forward face in order to test the accuracy, which tested out to be three seconds. During this process, we utilized the remote elevation method of leveling. In order to maintain accuracy with this instrument, we uh, made sure that we utilized a uh, prism rod that was connected to a bipod and we made sure that we sighted the exact center of the prism so that we were not off by several hundredths of a foot. <coughs> Furthermore, we also maintained multiple sightings on each point in order to get redundant results. Similar to the situation with the automatic level, we also uh, chose to use a digital level which was a Sokia SDL-50 digital level, which is accurate to within four, four thousandths of a foot. Similarly to the automatic level, we maintained four, four sites and back sites that were below 150 feet in either direction. We set up at the midpoint of, in between each set of points so that we eliminated collimation errors. We did two peg tests prior to every time that we utilized this instrument and had a uh, closure of one one hundredths of a foot. And we utilized a bipod along with a level bubble on the barcode rod so that we could make sure that we were plumb to the surface of the earth. And we also made sure that we were perpendicular to the instrument so that we did not have any measurement error. Following our selection of the instrumentation usages, we then proceeded on to methodology and conducted a pre-site visit. During this pre-site visit, we evaluated the range of topography that we had so that we had a good range of surfaces so that we could get some noticeable differences potentially. Also, we identified where our 21 points were going to be located, verified that there were appropriate distances between set points so that we were not too far in between points, selected points of varying uh, surface types so that we could get a range of soils and hard surfaces to uh, set set points into. We also determined an appropriate length, which ended up being three quarters of a mile. Furthermore, we also looked at uh, situations such as obstructions and line of sight so that we did not run into any issues during our field work. We also devised a plan where we needed to conduct with each instrument two level loops per instrument during the course of our field work. The reason being is that we figured that we needed to have a baseline comparison of all of our point elevations prior to an extended period of freezing temperatures, which we defined as B. Seven consecutive days of 24 hours a day of temperatures below 32 <coughs> degrees Fahrenheit. We then would proceed after said period of time and complete with each instrument the same exact level loop on the same points to be able to ascertain and divine each of the point elevations. For our references, we utilized the latest and greatest horizontal datum NAD, NADD-88. As far as uh, coordinate system, we utilized the Minnesota County Coordinate System, Hennepin County, as our geographic reference system. During the field work, we attempted to utilize second and third order methods because first order monuments in Minnesota are extremely rare. The closest first order monument to our location site was at the University of Minnesota. We did not really think that that was advisable for us to try to level in, on a university campus that we weren't students at with a population of approximately 80,000 students and a great deal of traffic. We utilized as our point of beginning for this project NGS Monument 2752D, which is located in a concrete bridge abutment located along Minnesota Trunk Highway 55 in the city of Minneapolis. We came off of this monument after checking in at another monument that was close by to it to verify that it was accurate and then conducted our level loop. We set 21 points of varying types. Some of them were PK nails, some of them were six inch hubs, some were three inch hubs, some were one foot galvanized nails, and so on and so forth, in various types of surface materials, such as two and a half inches of asphalt trail, six inches of concrete sidewalk, silty loams, 
clay soils, and etc. Simultaneously, during this field work process, we also monitored the moisture and the daily recorded moisture and uh, temperature uh, values from three NOAA weather monitoring stations that triangulated our project site. We did this for a period of five months. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, each day that is indicated in blue is a precipitation value that is the average of each of these three monitoring stations around our project site that is greater than trace precipitation, which we defined as anything greater than one, uh, one tenth of an inch of precipitation. On the right-hand side of the screen, we simultaneously tracked the day part temperatures per day for five months that were below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, because anything above 32 degrees Fahrenheit did not, was not really germane to our investigation. As you can see, we did not reach a consistent period of freezing temperatures below 32 degrees Fahrenheit until the week before Christmas. So in the course of uh, doing our field work, we came across uh, some issues and challenges. Nonetheless, they did not stop us from uh, carrying out our project and uh, achieving our goals. And they included uh, unusual weather. As you can see, November 2016 was the warmest on record so far in Minnesota. And for this reason, it projected uh, it pushed forward at uh, the time we had projected to complete our project. As well, we had a cheap years in all those due to trace cover and overhang. Uh, I remember some points we had to spend more than 15 minutes to take a reading on a point. Also, uh, we lost one team member. As well, we tried to reach out to the, our regional NGS coordinator for some scholarly information about the project, but unfortunately, our efforts weren't successful. And in addition, we tried as well to reach out to a geotechnical company to give us some relevant information for the same, but we did not, they did not uh, uh, respond to us. We also had uh, construction activities, activities uh, uh, at the park, such as uh, brush cutting and tree trimming. And we, uh, from ourselves, we suspect that some of our points were pushed, were pushed down during the cutting of the, uh, of the brush. We also, we also had uh, some ones Two points in particular, they, they were disturbed, and we had to reset them. We tried so much to reset them to the original level that we set them up, but then we are not very sure whether we came to the point. So we had also lots uh, being destroyed by keys. It was it is a public park, and it was uh, hard for us to locate, to locate some points during the snow cover. We took our data, gathered from pre- and post-frost conditions, and compared each method to the digital level as it was the most accurate form of measurement. The group also compared and contrasted two data sets. See above, this is pre-frost, below is post-frost. The color coordination is as follows. Anything in the green was less than, these are methods, again, comparing each form of measurement. So this is the differential between those. Anything in green is less than two hundredths of foot differential. Anything in yellow is between two hundredths and four hundredths foot. And anything red is greater than four hundredths of foot differential. This slide shows our results for the digital level, as it was the most accurate. The info includes from left to right, the point number, the point type, oh, excuse me, all right, the point type, the soil type, pre-frost measurement, post-frost measurement, and the delta values. And on the furthest right, possible theories as to why those were 
the results we receive. Anything, again color code, anything in orange is an increase in elevation. Anything in white was no change in elevation. Anything purple was a decrease in elevation. Orange, uh, possible reason is upheaval of uh, the soil surface due to moisture below the ground freezing. Uh, if you look at point uh, 108 was our biggest change, 0.094. Anything uh, the white, if you uh, notice point 100, as Patrick said before, that was a known point and monument, as said in the bridge embankment. So there was not going to be a lot of change as far as soil. I mean, obviously heavy cement. And the purple, the majority of the purples were disturbed. Uh, especially point 112 had to be reset. Our results indicated that the digital, digital level was the most accurate, as I said before. GPS was absolutely the least accurate of the forms we used to measure. Point changes are as follows. 66.7 of our 21 points increased in elevation. 23.8% decreased and 9.5% were unchanged. We also noticed that 12 out of the 15 raised elevations were set in soil. So while the results of our project are interesting and certainly point to the fact that there is a need in the academic community and the surveying community to do some further investigation on this topic, we come to the ultimate question. Why is elevation and high precision vertical control important, not only in the workforce, but in today's society? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that oftentimes projects will span multiple years and multiple seasons. It is essential for you to know where you are vertically in relation to where you are spatially at any point in time during a project. Furthermore, there are always design and regulatory requirements that need to be met. For example, if you are a project manager or a surgeon or an engineer and you are laying several kilometers of uh, asphalt walking trail in a public park, you need to maintain compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which states that you cannot exceed more than 5% uh, uh, grade in forward path of travel and no more than 2% cross slope. If you do not maintain high precision vertical control during the course of this project and you complete it, and let's say that your local Department of Transportation inspector comes out to verify that you have met your design and regulatory requirements for the sec segment of the public who is handicapped and disabled, and you do not meet those requirements, you're going to have to tear out your trail and you're going to have to relay it. Not only does this waste significant amount of time and money, but it also equates to the fact that no one likes to do a bad job and no one likes to lose their job. Another anecdote would, that is an even more serious and more impactful is the example of trying to match in a drainage structure into an existing drainage structure. Let's say that you're laying several miles of uh, uh, reinforced concrete pipe with catch basins and storm manholes and you're trying to hit an invert elevation on an existing structure and you do not maintain high precision vertical control and you don't establish it throughout the course of your project properly and then you get to the structure that you're supposed to match into and similarly to in our case where we had 0.15 difference either positive or negative total cumulatively in elevation you're not going to likely match into that structure. What are you to do? Are you going to go to your supervising engineer or your supervising survey to the city council or the mayor and say, well, we have to tear up four miles worth of structures and storm pipe because we made a mistake. Or we have to put in a $500,000 lift station. All of these scenarios and anecdotes and the drama and the heartache and the pain can be avoided by practicing and maintaining one simple task, maintaining and establishing high precision vertical control. Our group would like to thank the NSPS for inviting us here and having us participate in this competition and represent our school. It has helped us uh, further our knowledge and skills in our chosen profession. And we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.
had seen in a lot of years, it was PK nails and wood hubs. Had you considered using iron pipes or rods or rebar? Because like in our area, we do not use rebar at all. It's prohibited in our, the county that I do most of my work in because rebar will be picked up by the frost more than a smooth rod. Did you look at anything else as far as the different types of monuments? We tried to be as non-invasive as possible because it was a public park. Okay. So that is part of the reason we chose the materials we did. We did not want to put the, uh, the public, especially we discovered after the weather change that it was, uh, there was a cross-country ski trail that ended up going through our project site for a uh, community um, ski race in January, and uh, we didn't realize, we didn't put it together, that that's uh, why they were doing the brush cutting, but then we figured it out after, the, uh, after we completed our project. And now, looking back, we're actually fairly glad that we did not put any elevated um, points up because somebody would have broken a ski, they could have gotten injured. Um, you know, you certainly do not want to uh, have the liability of that um, from an educational standpoint, and you know, that points to just the importance of why this is important from a professional standpoint as well. Nobody likes to make mistakes. You measured the changes after a frost had occurred. Do any of your marks remain in place that one can return after the thaw to see if they return or if they maintain their position? Yes, they're actually all there. We have to uh, go out there before the end of the semester and remove all of them. But because we had um, extended periods of cold temperatures and not a lot of snow, we suspect that the uh, frost line is down for fairly far. However, we're not 100% positive because the closest frost monitoring station that Minnesota maintains is 200 miles away from Minneapolis. So we didn't think that that was accurate enough to be able to get depth from. So we're going to need to wait until the temperatures thaw up and then before we graduate in May we will go to the uh, spots and uh, maybe do some reinvestigation just to verify what we think and then um, remove all of our, our marks just because we don't want to leave anything behind. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much.